not just spread the word, let people know. I know a lot of people do want to help in times of need, and certainly this is a, a big one. So let's remember that. Uh, also remember uh, the Duke Creel family. Um, Duke is, uh, he actually was a member of our fire department, but he lost a daughter um, very early age, I think probably early 20s um, this week. So let's, let's remember them. Anyone else? Any, uh, let's continue to remember Donnie and him because his mom will be undergoing surgery on Wednesday. So let's, let's just pray that everything goes great with that and she has a speedy recovery. Any unspoken requests? Let's take them all before the Lord this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you, God. We're so grateful to be able to come into your house this morning, Lord. So thankful for your many blessings and God, just your hand of protection, your hand of provision for each and every one of us, God. God, we're, we're so undeserving, but yet so thankful, God, for all that you've done for us and what you're doing. Ask you, God, today for these needs, so many needs, Lord, so much heartache and mass destruction, God, across this land. And, Lord, we just ask you, Lord, that you, being the peace speaker, would speak peace to the hearts, to the lives, to the situations of many of these people that are suffering today. And, God, we just ask you, Lord, that you would touch their brokenness this morning. God, that you would lift them up, and Lord, that, that some way you would just give them exactly what they need, God. When our words are so inadequate and we don't know what to say, God, we know that you know exactly what they need. And ask you, Lord, that you be the provider of that this morning. Ask you, God, that you would meet with us in this house this morning, Lord, that you would touch needs that are present right here among your people. Heal broken bodies, God, men, circumstances, and situations, Lord, for your people again today. God, we give you praise in advance for your awesomeness and the works that you'll perform among your people with just a mustard seed of faith present in the house today. God, we give you praise. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of our lesson this morning is Warnings Against Worldly Attitudes. And uh, I, I, thought, I thought about it right off the bat. I am very quick uh, in our house to remind my little one uh, about and my, and my older one I guess if I were, were being truthful about attitudes uh, what is an attitude what you know what is that I will tell you this that your attitude affects your altitude in other words our attitude can affect how high we proceed or how high we achieve and what we're able to do, uh, all is dependent upon our attitude. Now, our attitude is our actions uh, or, or our innermost being in action is really what it is. Uh, when we are rotten on the inside, I guarantee you our attitude is going to reflect it on the outside. Uh, it's just the way that it that it works, and uh, I will tell you there are times that probably I, I, I can speak for me. I can't speak for anyone else, but there are times uh, that I get a rotten attitude. Uh, usually, there's a reason behind that. It's either a lacking of prayer time, or a lacking of God's word, or something to that effect. Uh, that be I begin to let things creep in that affects my attitude. Um, you know, I, I tell people all the time, especially uh, in, in my work life and my career, is dealing with people uh, very similar to, to this weekend that are at their lowest. You know, they, they, they're in bad circumstances, either health-related or tragedy or disaster or something along those lines in which we're dealing with these folks. And the last thing that they need to see from me is a snubbed up, frowned up face with an attitude, you know. Uh, that's the last thing they need to see. What they do need to see is somebody that's willing, even though we may not know who they are. And I got in trouble the other day. But I didn't realize I was on television while teaching Sunday school. Not really television on Facebook, somebody said, you need to fix your collar. So I just realized my collar was sticking up, so maybe I'm fixed. Uh, 
But nonetheless, you know, I, what they do need is they need somebody that, even though they don't know them, that'll, that'll wrap their arm around them and, and, and hold them close in that time of need and ask them, what can I do for you? You know, what, what can I do? Because they need that. They don't need somebody that is all high and mighty and better than thou or any of those kinds of things. That's the last thing that we need. And we've got to fend against acquiring a worldly attitude. What is the world's attitude for, for this day and hour that we're living in? You want me to tell you what it is? I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's called entitlement. Entitlement. That is the dominating attitude that the world is spreading. They're spreading it throughout our kids. They're spreading it throughout our college age students. They're spreading it throughout our young adults and, and people that, uh, you know, uh, man, I, I get people that, that come fresh out of college and, and yeah, they got a degree. They got their name on a piece of paper and I'm thankful for that. I think that is a wonderful thing. It's awesome. But I had a preacher told me one time, said, yeah, go to school get your degree and then get over it. But they will come in and they will tell you, you know, I, I had a young guy that, that I was interviewing for a position and, and he did have a degree in, in the job that, that I was needing him to fulfill. But the first thing he said, he said, well, you know, since I have this, I want about, and he'd give me a price, which was about twice what anybody else would have been making in that position. And uh, I said, okay, I appreciate it. Good to see you. Uh, be in touch. And it's in touch by phone call that says, hey, we've hired somebody else. You know, we are not entitled to anything. Anything. Nobody owes me anything. And, and we get that way sometimes. If we're not careful, if we're not careful, you know, the devil will let us know, you know, man, you know, you, you've been living this way for a long time and you deserve this. No, we don't deserve it. Read God's word and see what it tells us. We have got to fend against worldly attitudes. Now, now I will tell you, entitlement is certainly not the only worldly attitude out there. Lord knows there's a lot of them, but I cannot stand to see uh, especially our young generation, and that's what bothers me the most, is our kids that feel like they deserve X, Y, Z, all these things. You know, it's owed to me. It's not. It's not. And we better be careful in, in getting that attitude. It is not something that, that we need to nourish. It's not something... We need to kill it at the root. It is work. It is earning. It is doing what is necessary in order to achieve the things that we have or that we accomplish or that we do. Uh, it, it, it's so important. So we're going to be reading in the book of James again today, James chapter number 4 and verse number 1 down through verse number 3. It said, verse number four, uh, chapter number four, verse number one, from whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it with your lust. What James was saying in, in these, these three verses of Scripture is, is that people are willing to fight over stuff. Now, is that not a true statement in today's time? You know, every time you turn around, somebody's fighting over something. I will never forget uh, the first knuckle busting that I ever got into as a kid uh, was not over anything. It was not over an item. It was not over a, a piece of, uh, it wasn't over a toy or, 
you know, anything like that, it was because somebody said something about my mama. Now, was that not the quick thing you always said? You know, everybody jump up, your mama. What did that mean? We didn't know, but it was worth fighting over. You know, we felt like it was it was honor more than anything, I guess, uh, on that. That is not the society that we're living in today. It is a continual battle over stuff. My land. I, I you read the news or you listen to to all these stories of people that go to as far as murdering an individual for you know a, a dollar's worth of uh, corn seed or something. And I mean that's that's that sounds I, you know minute. But it's a fact. People are willing to do that today. They call it being disrespected. The Bible calls it being majorly prideful. Being ma That's right, Caden. I agree, buddy. Being <laughs> You'll turn around and just smile. Being majorly prideful. Having pride in our own self that, you know, I am something, you don't disrespect me. Let me tell you what, my mom and daddy disrespected me a lot of times, and it was on my rump with a switch or a belt, and they taught me to be respectful. And that is missing in today's world. Our kids grow up being disrespectful and they feel like it is okay. Our young people across this land feel like they are the ones that are owed respect instead of being respectful. And that's what James was saying in verse number one through three. You don't ask anything because you ask it amiss because you know your own lust. You're trying to feed your own self. When's the last time that we ask God to supply the needs of another individual that had no financial impact on us? When's the last time that we prayed that God would bountiful, bountifully bless our neighbor rather than fill my own cupboard? That's what he said. He said you ask amiss because you're just asking for yourself. You're just wanting to feel your own lust. You know, what is lust? I know everybody goes to sexual immoralities and all those things, but lust is so much more than that. It is longing for something. All the time. Consumes your thoughts, consumes your mind, consumes what you do. Lusting for it. Can't live without it. He said that's what you're asking for. It's stuff to fulfill that. Let me tell you what. I let me let me first say, I am so thankful for God's blessings upon my life and, and my family and and all. And and yeah, God has blessed us more than I ever will deserve. I'd never be able to deserve what God has, has blessed me with. Never. But I can tell you, and I'm not telling you from something I read in a book or I've heard some old timer tell me or anything else. I'm telling you from experience. It doesn't matter what physical things, money, cars, houses, prestige, none of those things. I don't, it doesn't matter how much of that you get. It will never fulfill what your heart desires. It will never fulfill that. It won't. It won't. Because when God breathed into us the breath of life, he did not breathe in us the desires for physical things. He breathed in us the desire for our innermost being to become reconnected to him. And no amount of money no amount of vehicles, houses, or anything else will ever be able to fulfill that desiring connection. Won't do it. Won't do it. 
So what am I longing for? What am I reaching for? In verse number four, down through verse number six, he said, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Let me tell you, you know, a, a lot of people, and I, I know there's a lot of different denominations and, and things, you know, that, that have identifying traits and all that they say that that is to, that is a separation, you know, from the world. I don't disregard or disrespect those things whatsoever. If you want to do that, absolutely fine. When I was in Missouri, uh, I was able to, to see some of the Amish and, and how they lived. And, all, and I respect that, I'll tell you. you know, do I feel like it is necessary? I, I don't, but I don't feel like it's wrong either by any means. Uh, I, I respect that. I respect their prestige to live a separated life in that regard. But one of the things the Bible said that you know, being friends with the world is being an enemy with God. That's pretty, pretty point blank. What is he saying? If I feel comfortable living in this world, I would better check my heart. I better check my heart. Because when I feel comfortable in this world, I don't want to move. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to do anything. If I feel okay living the life that the world says I ought to be living, something is separating me from what God wants me to live. Guaranteed, without a doubt. So we have to be careful. He said, ye are in this world, but ye are not a part of this world. Don't be like the world. Okay, Brother Donnie, well, tell me what's the world. Look around. Fortune, fame, fashion, pride, prestige, lust, adulterism, fornication, you know, all kinds of things. That is even being preached from pulpits in this nation that it is okay. That it's okay. We have somehow watered this doctrine down to where we don't know what it tastes like anymore. I'll never forget, I, my, my wife, she'll beat me for this, but that's okay, I get beat occasionally. Uh, years and years and years ago, she had made some, uh, some sweet tea. In a, in when, that was back when we didn't run to the grocery store and buy it, we just actually made it, put it on the stove, heated it up, put sugar in it, you know, kind of thing. And so we did that, or she did that, and uh, it was rather sweet. Matter of fact, it was very sweet. So we poured out about the top third of it or whatever, and she added water to it and stirred it up, you know, and, and it was much better. And uh, so we left it in the refrigerator a couple of days, and it just seemed like it was sweet again, or too sweet again. And so we did the same thing, you know. She's come up with this brilliant idea that she said, you know, said, we just keep doing this right here and, and you know, we'll just always, it's like it was just going to keep producing or something, which she didn't mean it that way at all. But, you know, and, and I started laughing and I got to thinking, I said, you know, I said, that's how we think sometimes. That's exactly how I think that sometimes. You know, man, this is the way to do this. Well, you know what? At the end of the week, guess what you're going to have? water we dilute ourselves down now I love sweet tea I will tell you right now I love it I drink it regular I do not drink unsweet I do not drink that stuff with poison splendor in it it's not poison but I just need to taste it I like sweet tea but if I can convince myself that I can just keep diluting it down then I adjust my taste not to be able to tell the difference. Let me tell you, we have to be careful 
with those types of attitude, because that would be my attitude, that, hey, I'll just keep adding water to it until, you know, I mean, why? Because I'm lazy and I don't want to make any more. I don't, I don't want to have to go through that process again. It takes a little bit of time to start fresh and to start over. I think that's why I go to the grocery store now and do it. But I will adjust my taste, my requirement, to accept pure water eventually. And I know water's good for you, and I know all that. I hate water personally. I, I just don't drink it. don't like it. Okay? I know it's great for you. God designed it for healthiness of our body. I understand all that. But I will adjust my, my requirement, my, my, my taste bud, to say, hey, this is okay. No, it's not okay. Not if I want tea, it's not okay. Not if I'm desiring the taste of that sweetness, it's not okay. But I deluded myself down to believe we have to be careful in the church not to allow our faith to delude us down to where we blend in with the world and nobody is able to look at us and to tell, hey, that's sweet tea and that's water. You know? What's the first thing I do? Look at it through the glass. Yeah, that looks like tea. I hold that glass of water up. I'm concerned. It's either one of two things. If it's bubbling, it's Sprite, and if it's not, it's water. Okay? The world better be able to tell us apart. They've got to tell us. If I've got the same attitude, if I've got the same mentality, if I have accepted the things of the world as being okay, then I am... I'm not just a part of the world. I'm in the world. I mean, I'm, I'm consuming it. And that's what he said. He said, if you're doing that, then you're going to be an enemy with God. Verse number five, he went on to say, he said, do ye think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. God does not like the proud. Now, everybody says, well, I'm proud of that. There's a difference. There's a difference. He said, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit goeth before a fall. Those two things are mixed together. Pride and haughtiness. What does that mean? Look at me. You know what I'm proud of? I'm proud of, look at them. I'm proud of when I'm able to say, look at my baby girl and my, my baby girls. Both of them are still my babies, even though one of them's older. You know, when I look at them, I'm proud. I'll be honest. I'm proud that whenever they sit down at the dinner table, they'll say, can I ask a question? That makes me proud. Those are the kind of things that we should be proud in. That's not what he's talking about. He said, pride goeth before destruction. Look who I am. Look what I've done. Look what I can give. Look what I can do. All of those kinds of things. It's not about me. And I don't mean it to be ugly, but it is not about you. It's about him. We can't, we can't get that meant. You know, I, I, I'm going to say it. I thought it. Um, I, I see these, especially kids. And, and I'm telling you, man, when I was 16 years old, 17 years old, I didn't have what these kids today have. Oh, I didn't even have remotely what they was. As a matter of fact, when I was 16 years old, Brother Rick, the very first car that I ever owned or was ever given I was not given. I bought myself. I worked a job, a summer job, and I saved up four hundred dollars, and I went and bought me a 1965 Chevrolet Biscayne uh, car. I called it the Tank. It was good looking. It was it was it was nice. I paid four hundred dollars for it, Mr. Walter Martin. I bought it from him, and man, that was a smooth running this old car and everything, you know, and. And I was proud of that dude, man. I mean, it was mine. I bought it. I paid for it and all. 
And then I look around here and I see these kids today, man, they sitting in $50,000 trucks and, and cars that, you know, and, and, and I, I, I rode by the uh, Roses parking lot the other night and uh, had a relative that I happened to see there and I was telling him, I said, man, I said, you know, I rode by Roses the other night and I said, there was a bunch of guys up there had some fine four-wheel drive pickup trucks and stuff sitting up there. I said, but it wasn't one problem with them. And he said, what? I said, it looked like a pack of dogs that all had worms. He said, what are you talking about? I said, their back end was dragging the ground and the front end was stuck up in the air. I said, that's what dogs do when they're not feeling well. I said, what is wrong with y'all? He said, but that's cool. I said, oh, oh, I get it. I, I, I missed that part of it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm not cool. I, I didn't fit in that there thing, you know. But you know, and, and I'm picking on our kids. They, if they want to drive them like that, that's them. I, 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 did, I did it the other way. I had a car. I wanted the front end on the ground and the back end stuck up in there like that. So it's, it's to each his own. And I am literally just picking with our kids. But I'm going to tell you something. You know, there's a lot of them that I see running up down the road today, and it's all about, look at me. Look at me. Look at what I am, what I've done, what I can do. Don't let that mentality get in our minds. Don't let that creep into our homes and you know, I, I've always heard that, and I don't really know what it means, I guess, but it's always been called keeping up with the Joneses. I have a hard time keeping up with me. I don't need the, the task of trying to keep up with somebody else. I don't need that. You know, am I thankful for what God's done? Absolutely. But I got to keep up with me and manage me. I, I'm a hard management process sometimes. Sometimes I, I, I get bent out of shape. Focusing on what God has done helps us not achieve that worldly attitude, that worldly mentality. And I'm not telling you don't strive for great things. Do. God's plan for your life is to bless you and to increase you and to do all those things. So, I mean, if you achieve it, great. You know, if you can... Do it, do it. Just don't let it be about you. That makes the difference. In verse number seven, he said, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If I want or wanted, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking way out of the box. If, you know, if there was some brand new truck I pick trucks because I like trucks you know that so far out of my realm but yet God allowed me to, to do that and I got it what would it do to me I'd be oh look at me you know probably but I'm going to tell you there's nothing wrong if I can do it do it. Great. But he said, resisting the devil. What does that mean? Hey, brother, it's not, it's not me. It's all about him. I am a glorified piece of mud scooped up out of the earth, formed by the hands of God, breathed into the breath of life. I didn't have any say so in any of that stuff. It was all what God was able to do. And that's what, that's you. You and I together. The blessings that come after that, those are just the benefits of serving the maker. Just resist the devil. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy 
to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. If you want to go up, you got to get down. I'm not talking about boogie dancing or nothing. I'm talking about we got to humble ourselves before God. And there's a world out there that needs to see humbleness. Because if it's not humbleness, it's pride. One or the other. It's either humbleness or pride. And he said, if you will be humble, he will lift you up to where you want to be. <clears throat> Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Therefore, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art that judgest another? He said, go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. God's process for our gain is through him. You know, it's sort of like making heaven. I, I tell people all the time, you know, we can try getting to heaven any which way we want to, but there's not one that's going to work. You know, I'm not saying that there's not a number of options out there that you can try, but there's only one that's going to work. I remember years ago, we were at the Mississippi State Fair uh, one day, and they had this little thing. It was a, a glass house maze. And you had to go in one door, and you had to try to figure yourself out. You know, have you ever seen all the slobber and the snot that's on the glass and, you know, throughout those things? You want me to tell you why? You want me to tell you what that represents? Failure. That represents failure. Simply because it's where somebody ran into the wall. You know, we think, hey, this is the way I go. <laughs> you know, we leave our mark on the wall. And I will never forget getting in the, and I, I'd work my way, you know. Of course, everybody in there is feeling, you know, trying to, to get to where. Come on, buddy, you can help me first. Come on. That's my baby. Come on. But I ain't coming now. He ain't going to hurt me, Terry. Uh, but, you know, I remember getting into the middle of that glass room and literally I thought, these dudes had done pulled a trick on me because there's no way out. There was the one opening that I just came in and it felt like to me there was, there was three different walls that I couldn't go any further and I hadn't made it to the end. And the, the bad thing about it was I'm standing there in front of everybody who's walking up and down the midway, you know, at the fair, and they walk by and they're looking, you know, and here I am. I'm hung up in the middle for everybody to see. But I knew, I knew that there had to be a door to get out. There had to be. There had to be a way to get out. But you know the problem? They all look the same. Everywhere I was at in there looked identically the same. It was just glass. But there was only one way me to get through there and I had to back up to where I knew I came in and I had to take my time and find where I was supposed to be let me tell you what along this journey living for God I'm not going to tell you that there are times that we run into a brick wall I'm not going to tell you that there's not times that I hit that wall and think oh this is the way I should be going but I can't It's the way I think I should be going, but I shouldn't. God has one way that I'm going to make it, and it is simply humbling myself, putting myself at his feet. God, I don't know where to go. I don't know how to get any further. I mean, I'm trying everything I can, and I keep hitting the wall. He said, humble yourselves. Submit yourselves unto him. He 
He said he'd lift us up. He would put us to where he wanted us to be. He wants you to gain. God is a God of addition and multiplication, not subtraction and division. His desire for you is to gain. It's to grow. It's to proceed. You know, I, I tell people all the time, look, man, if you're a millionaire, you don't need to be ashamed of that. You don't have to be ashamed of it. You don't have to think, you know, well, I'm so undeserving. Yeah, we all are. You know, you don't have to be but what we do have to do is say, man, let me tell you something. God's grace and mercy, God's provision and God's significance in our life, this is by far the only way to make it. This is it. Humbleness. And, and, and our world's missing that today. There's a worldly attitude of I deserve I, I should have, I, you know, somebody should give me, all those types of things. That's a worldly attitude. God's attitude for us is to be, let me press forward to the mark of the high calling of God. Let me push till I achieve what God wants for me to achieve. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you, God. So grateful for your blessings. Thankful today, God, for your awesome word. Lord, I pray, God, that you shield our minds, our hearts, our beings today from the worldly attitude of deserving and entitlement. God, I pray, Lord, that you embed in our hearts the desire to push forward, to work, to gain those things that, God, that you have in store for us. And knowing, Lord, that it is only through you, by you, that we are able to do what we're able to do today, God. I'm so grateful today for your awesomeness. God, I ask you, Lord, just to continue this throughout this service this morning. Lord, let your blessings rain down upon your people afresh. In Jesus' name we pray.